And here they come down the stairs to the basement. Look at this motley crew. Jeff Brown, <laughs> Jesse Wisniewski coming down. Have a seat, gentlemen. How are you? Good, thanks. Well, thank you. Well, I'm- Lovely I'm, place. Uh, well, well, thank you. The shag carpeting makes it, doesn't it, Jesse? <laughs> it does. And Jesse, while I'm while I'm talking to you, let's kick this off with a question for you. Forty three million adults in the USA, I was reading, possess low literacy skills, and that's kind of the the bottom side of this. This project started with you. Why were you so focused on reading when you set out to to make this book? It really started out for me. The first book I ever bought on my own was The Art of War by Sun Tzu. I'm probably butchering his name and pronouncing it, but I was going on a date with a girl who is now my wife. Because and- girls love ancient combat. That's what <laughs> that's- <laughs> they, they do. And that was the, the name. I don't. I can't recall why I purchased the book, but I'm sure it had something to do with the word war in the book. And I'm like, at least it attracted, it drew me into it, probably not so much her. But to your point, I was going into combat to win the affection of this woman. And so since she was a reader, I figured I should actually read a book and have something potentially intelligent to talk about. And I probably just at least in passing mentioned that I read the book and maybe let out a couple of grunts about what I thought about it. But Needless to say, after that date, uh, she is now my wife uh, a couple of years later, and I have read a lot more books since then. But uh, to answer your question, going back full circle, reading for me has been just so transformative in terms of you know learning new skills, maybe going through challenges, uh, solving problems, uh, working through personal or professional issues. And since I've had such a tremendous impact of reading on my life, uh, this started with, well, I wanna share what I've learned with others. And that's what really started the motivation for me behind uh, originally writing this book and outlining it before working with Jeff. You know, it's funny, Jesse, as you're talking and a couple great lines from Sun Tzu, because that's also, I, I was, you know, joking around, but that is one of my favorites. Uh, the best mm. battle is the one that's never fought is one of my favorite lines from Sun Tzu. And reading kind of does that for you. It looked like you had early on in the book, you talk about uh, an issue in your life where there was a battle about to be fought. You were about to be be eliminated. Your job was going to be eliminated, right? And you kind right. of, to use more Sun Tzu, you kind of redefine the battlefield using reading. No, yeah, exactly. It was one of those issues, no ill will against the organization or the team or anything. The organization was just going through some changes. I saw the writing on the wall and knew that I needed to make some sort of pivot with my work. My family and I had just moved cross country for me to take this position. Wasn't inclined to pack up the bags and move everybody you know, across country again. But yeah, so it was one of those things like, okay, I have an opportunity to make a potential pivot. I picked up a tremendous amount of books on that particular topic, content marketing, because I was working as a copywriter or staff writer at the time. So I figured, okay, here's an opportunity. I need to learn more about this. I kind of understand some about it. I didn't have the resources or the time to actually maybe go back to school or get a certificate or something like that. But I did have the time and the money to purchase a bunch of books on the topic, which then afforded me the opportunity to learn what I needed to learn, put together proposals, some different ideas, pitch the idea. Long story short, it worked out, made the pivot and the change internally with the organization. And now it's a story in a book. That's so amazing. <laughs> Another great book is Who Moved My Cheese, right? Where people get upset that the cheese that you saw the cheese moving and you you moved ahead of time. Yes. So the cheese was on the move and I needed to catch up with the cheese. (laughs) Jeff, the early days of your cheese sounds like you read J.R.R. Tolkien for fun. You read whatever they told you to read in high school and college. And as a 20 year old, you're like, forget this reading thing. I want nothing to do with this. (laughs) That's exactly right. I left school going, gosh, thank goodness all the learning is done. I don't have to do that anymore. I don't have to read anymore. I don't have to write papers anymore. The school really educated out of me, if I'm being honest, the desire to read. And and I don't mean any ill will toward teachers. My sister's a teacher and a darn good one. And some teachers of mine in the past have had some of the biggest influence on my life. But you know, the school, the way it's structured, uh, what was structured then and in large part now is assigning work to us that we don't really like. <laughs> Some things we have to learn that just to me did not make for an enjoyable experience at all. And I just couldn't wait for it to be over. And so for the better part of 10 years, Joe, I went through the entirety of my 20s without reading at all. 
of any kind, with the exception of maybe an uh, entertainment magazine of some type. Um, and it wasn't until I was in my early 30s that sort of serendipitously uh, the stars and planets aligned. Uh, a leader that I looked up to recommended a book to me, and that happened to be Seth Godin's Purple Cow. I was not aware, this is embarrassing to admit, but I just was not aware that there were books out there like that, uh, that I could actually find books I enjoyed reading that weren't fiction. And I love fiction, too. As I began to dive into that book, it just opened my eyes to a world of possibility, similar to what Jesse was just saying. And I and I thought, well, I can actually you know, people much, much smarter than me have written their ideas and their thinking and, and all of that in, a, in something as easy to consume as a book. And in the span of a few hours, I can know what they spent years learning. Uh, where do I sign up? And uh, from that point on, I could not get enough. I started reading. That was 2003, about a book a week. And I haven't stopped since. And it launched a podcast and a big part of the reason why we're here today. Yeah, I got, mm-hmm. I've got so many questions about that. What I think we're talking about is, Jeff, that you made yourself a curriculum. And Jesse, when you were thinking you might lose your job, you created a curriculum for how to not just keep your job, but how to succeed. And I think we'll come back to this idea of designing a curriculum over time. But before mm-hmm. I get to that, where does the phrase read the lead originally come from? Ooh, uh, you know, I've heard it uh, a lot of different places. In fact, probably more places since I started my podcast than I realized existed before I started the podcast. Uh, The first time I heard it, it was uttered by a mentor of mine, a guy by the name of Michael Hyatt. And I think the way he said it was leaders read and readers lead. And that just stuck with me. That really resonated with me the first time I heard him say that. And I think, uh, was it one of our former presidents who said all leaders are readers, but not all readers are leaders or something along those lines. So similar sort of uh, quote. But when I heard that phrase from Michael, leaders read and readers lead, again, it just resonated with me. And when it came time to start my podcast and I had decided to do a podcast where I interview other authors about their books, about business books and nonfiction in particular, I took that phrase, that quote, and I just shortened it to read to lead. And at the time I thought, well, this is pretty original, Yeah, you know, but (laughs) since then I found out that's not necessarily the case. (laughs) (laughs) But original is not always great. You know, one of my favorite books, another one of my favorite books, and we're going to mention as many books as we can here, at least, and I'm going to ask you guys for as many books that have influenced you as possible, but Austin Kleon, Steal Like an Artist, right? I mean, uh, uh, Mm -hmm. originality isn't the great thing. It's building on the backs of other people so that we continue to learn. It's funny that you say, Jeff, that readers lead and leaders read because, Jesse, I believe you write that an Oxford University study found that 16 year olds who read books, who read books, I think, outside of school were later in life more likely to have managerial positions than those who did not read. Did I get that right? Yeah, that's right. So if that's the case, I mean, building a curriculum from the time that you're 16 really matters toward your success. Yeah, what the study found is, you know, followed the teenagers from that point up until, you know, later in life, early 30s, and that those who read outside for, you know, entertainment fun or whatever at the time were in managerial positions more so than their counterparts and peers in the study. But yeah, so I think it's equal parts curriculum, kind of like what you highlighted with my example with my previous employment. And and since then, I've done that on numerous occasions. For instance, I've got a stack of books behind me on branding, positioning that I'm getting ready to go through for the same fact. It's like, all right, I want to create, I need to do a deep dive on this particular subject. Let me create my own curriculum, read through these books, as well as, you know, I'll, you know, digest other material, blog posts, watch videos, listen to podcasts and stuff. But it's just one big step I take toward creating a curriculum, doing a deep dive, really learning it. So that's one big part of it. And then two, just reading in and of itself, whether you're reading books on leadership or branding or content marketing or whatever it could be, but just the act of reading studies have found that it makes you more empathetic. So, which is a tremendous quality as a leader. Mm -hmm. So being able to relate with someone emotionally kind of walking within his or her shoes, that goes a long way to influencing someone for the better. So just even reading in general on top of just you know creating your own curriculum and stuff is tremendously beneficial. I found that surprising. I also found, Jeff, that decision-making, right? That you write that uh, decision-making is better when you read. And, and I went, of course, I've read all these nonfiction books and mm-hmm. all these nonfiction books make me a better decision-maker. But you guys say, Jeff, that there's a different path to better decision-making and it's not nonfiction. It's actually fiction. 
<laughs> well, uh, that's more Jesse's territory than mine, if I'm being completely honest. But I believe that fiction plays a role in helping us be more creative. I think it plays a role in helping us make better decisions, as Jesse was just alluding to. I, I think it makes us more empathetic. Uh, we identify with characters. We better understand what they're going through. And when that translates to our lives and our relationships. So, yeah, I think fiction is not to be discounted. You know, I read mostly f uh, nonfiction, I'll admit. But I think there's a place for fiction, too, especially when it comes to our relationships and, as Jesse alluded, our leadership opportunities. Well, we've got some hardcore optimizer nerds that listen to our show, right? <laughs> and, and, and when I say that, all respect to these people. But, Jesse, when it comes to fiction, a lot of the optimizers will say, well, that's a waste of time. Nonfiction gets right to the point. What is it about <laughs> fiction that optimizers should tie in? Like, yeah, so with decision making, it's in a sense, it's twofold. Like, yeah, there are nonfiction books that will help you solve a specific challenge or overcome a particular problem. So it'll give you specific information on a specific decision. But now when it comes to fiction, what studies have found is that we get less of a need of what's called cognitive closure. Mm. Now, I'm not a trained psychologist. I'm just reading what's been out there on the research and stuff. So I'm going to just talk about it on a surface level. But in a sense, cognitive closure is a way of saying that Individually, we tend to want to avoid ambiguity when we prefer to make uh, decisions and perhaps just quickly without maybe thinking through them. But with reading fiction, what they found over time is it gives us a desire not to do that and to avoid it and to actually kind of make more informed decisions because we just don't have a desire to make a quick snap decision mm. on something. It's almost like you become OK with uncertainty. Yeah, mm -hmm. absolutely. So it gives you a sense of that ambiguity, even within the decision making process, because, you know, not a lot of things are black and white. There can obviously be a lot of gray area in certain things. Now, obviously, this doesn't have to do with when we get up in the morning and what we're putting on or what we're going to eat. I mean, that's pretty clear and cut, you know, decisions, but especially within leadership realms or in management or if you're a parent or guardian uh, relationships like, you know, there's a lot of ambiguity there. And being uncomfortable with that is, goes a long way in being able to just succeed or be more successful in his relationships and challenges. I remember when I thought I was going to become the next great middle grade fiction writer, I went mm -hmm. to a writing conference and this was, well, you'll know when it was based on the story as one of the benefits of going to this conference, you'd get to meet with an agent. I was really excited. New writer had my manuscript nearly finished uh, for this baseball book that I was writing. I knew enough to do some research ahead of time. And they said, ask a lot of questions, ask as many questions as you possibly can. And the last question I asked this agent was, so what's happening now in the world of middle grade fiction? And she said, there's this woman who's breaking all the rules. She's taking these teenagers and she's putting them in an arena where they have to kill each other. <laughs> and, and in middle grade fiction, you don't kill other kids. And now there's this ambiguity, right? I mean, and, and as you're talking, Jesse, I'm thinking about all the decision making. Of course, it went into the Hunger Games, right? Which yeah, the, the next right. year was huge. <laughs> I go home and I tell my my wife, Cheryl, that there's this horrible book coming out where kids have to kill each other. And of course, she read the entire series. But <laughs> and she loved it. it, it, it yeah. <laughs> but but there's so much gray area. And being, yeah. I guess, to illustrate what you're talking about, Jesse, me going okay with gray area, this ambiguity. And I don't want to kill other people. And what happens when I'm forced to? Oh, in terms of what, wanting to kill other people? <laughs> no, no, no. I guess that wasn't really a question as much as it was just a drop off yeah. sentence. <laughs> yeah. Jeff is a great yeah. podcaster. like, that wasn't a good question, Jeff. You should have oh, no. <laughs> done better there. I, know, I will say this. I, I'm impressed with this interview so far. You've definitely done your homework. So good on you. Well, thanks. Likewise. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, thanks. Now I'm going to blush. Let's talk about how, how you guys design your curriculum, you know, going back to that word. So you have a reading curriculum. You say it's not just reading exactly what you like all the time. So, uh, Jeff, let's start with you. How do you design your, your, what comes up next? Yeah, for me, and this has been the case when I worked a regular job, this is the case for me now. I identify something that I recognize I need to get better at or have potential to get better at. And that's pretty much everything, but I narrow it down <laughs> to <laughs> one or two things. And as Jesse was alluding earlier, I began researching books on that particular topic. I'll give you a couple of examples. When I was in the radio business, um, this was around late 2007 or eight, and, and social media is, is coming on strong. And, and all of us are trying to, regardless of our industry, trying to figure this thing out. And radio was certainly no exception. And how's this going to impact our industry? And how are we going to leverage this as a tool to maybe better connect with listeners and that sort of thing? 
And so I began reading everything I could find about social media and social media marketing and best practices. And what I found in short order is I was one of the few people that worked for my nationwide company that was doing anything like that, that was exhibiting or, or trying this habit of intentional, consistent reading. I was the only one that was attempting that. And what that made happen was that uh, through that process, I found that by doing that one thing that nobody else was doing, I put myself ahead of the rest of the pack in so many ways. So here's what I mean by that. For starters, I began being asked to do things that other people weren't being asked to do. So that meant as I was trying new things based on what I was reading, as I was failing at some of those things, I was getting noticed. The things that I did that didn't work quickly got forgotten. The things that I did that I was implementing and executing on got me noticed. And I was asked then to go, okay, you need to present to this group about what you're learning. You need to go present to that group about what you're learning. That led to me going, okay, I'm going to be presenting now. I better read some books on public speaking. (laughs) So I began doing that in public speaking, uh, presentation development and design and slide design, although everything you can think about related to public speaking, I would read about. And when it came time for the president of our company to then uh, visit stations uh, to develop his vision as a good leader does. He, he seeks input or she seeks input from those you know in their charge. He was making the rounds to stations around the country and saying, okay, what do you think should be a part of our next 10 years? And when it came to him coming to our station, my boss said, I want you to be the person presenting to the president. And oh, this wow. was in part because I was learning about this process. I was getting better at it. I was exhibiting practice and trying things that nobody else was trying. I did that. And then after seeing that presentation, the president said, hey, I want you to come and present that to the executive team at our annual meeting. Mm. That had never happened before. So I did that. And then once he began refining his vision, he came back to me months later and said, now I'm going to communicate this vision to the world, Jeff. I want you to create the presentation that I'm going to use to do that. So all of those opportunities and numerous promotions along the way all came about because I was doing one thing that virtually none of my coworkers and colleagues were doing, and that was reading about the things I needed to learn about creating that curriculum. And I continue to do that today. In large part, the last several years, it's been around mindset and understanding, uh, Joe, that that I'm capable of far more than I give myself <laughs> credit for, right? That uh, that when I open my, my mind, when I think about abundance instead of scarcity, I realize that there is so much more than I could accomplish if I'll take action. I used to think I had to believe myself enough to do this thing or that thing. Now I understand that the number one key is to take action first. And then as I take action, the belief and the confidence and all those things that I think have to be there before I start, those things catch up eventually. But it sounds like, Jeff, companies have just-in-time inventory. You have Mm just-in-time learning, it sounds like, where if you need something, you now naturally flex toward a book that's going to teach you that almost like Dan Sullivan has a, a book out called who, not how, right? Don't ask how, mm-hmm. ask who can teach me that. And for you, the world of books has a bunch of who's that are best in class at knowing what you need at the time. Yeah, exactly right. I mean, there's virtually no problem we're going to face that hasn't been faced by somebody else at some point. And nine times out of 10, or even more often than that, somebody's written about that process too. So why reinvent the wheel? Why not go to someone who's already solved that problem and and let them do the heavy lifting for you? Jesse, how about you? How does your curriculum work? Uh, Very similar to what Jeff's talking there. I think before answering that, what I'd like to encourage people tuning in and listening today is that well, you know, we're not talking about reading perhaps a number of books to obtain a PhD or a master's degree. When you think about it this way, that, for instance, 27 percent of Americans haven't read at least one book in the past year. And then most Americans haven't read more than four books in the past year. So when it comes to just understanding a particular topic or digging deep into something to better understand it, you know, reading one book, at least on a topic, means you're going to know more than most people read four more books on that particular topic. You're going to know more than, you know, even more Americans. This isn't a way of just saying comparing. This is just saying a way of, hey, when it comes to really digging in and understanding something, we're not talking about investing thousands of dollars or times. We're talking literally like, you know, a curriculum for you could be two to four, three to five books on something. Right. You really just want to better understand something on friendship, marriage, business, finances, parenting, I mean, so on and so forth. I mean, just pick up two or three books on that topic to just get started, like your own curriculum. As you get into it and start reading and understanding more so, then that's just going to start reading, you know, leading you down so many different paths that you can pursue. 
Uh, so I just want to encourage people listening, you know, with that, like, we're not talking perhaps a college curriculum on right. a college level course, <laughs> right. like, right? right? Like, this might not end up on your resume, but the benefits you reap from what you read will, you know, appear on, you know, from the results you produce and stuff. But yeah, when it comes to me, I've been since, you know, I've been doing this like Jeff for so many years now, and I've gone through undergraduate and graduate school and stuff. I'm, I'm pretty accustomed to it, but it's, uh, you know, for instance, I was alluding to branding earlier. So that was a particular topic I wanted to dig in more to soon, just because, as Jeff pointed out something, it's like a particular gap I feel or experience in my professional work that I want to dig into and highlight and just go in all. So over the years, I've read plenty of books on marketing. So I had a kind of a good idea what I should, shouldn't read, looked online to find what are books people are recommending. And they even reached out to people, you know, peers or people acquainted with or just even shot someone a tweet online, like, hey, what books do you recommend on this particular topic? And so from that, I'm able to put together my curriculum, like, okay, I want to read these books on this topic. And while I'm reading through those books, it's uh, taking notes on those. Uh, So one system that I use that we talk about in the book is a note card system. It's something I picked up from Ryan Holiday that he shared uh, through his online publications writing on a commonplace book. So it's not something I've been doing as long or as robust as he has. But after reading a book, making the marks and notes and stuff in there, then transferring those notes into index cards. So that way I have them in one place to pull on later for whatever I'm working on or perhaps a book or article I'm writing. You're going through there, taking the notes, saving those notes. I would imagine that helps with your retention too, Jesse. Oh, yeah, 100 percent. Uh, Because one of the things even with that, like I love writing stuff down now, Uh, like, for instance, uh, using a paper journal for daily and weekly planning, just the act of like writing down stuff and taking it from, you know, an app or digital tool, like a project management tool for work and just simply putting it down on paper or just writing notes down during the notes like on paper helps me to recall and remember what everything was going on and stuff. So, yeah. A couple tactical things that I want to ask about. We have master class as a sponsor. We've had Skillshare as a sponsor in the past. YouTube, as you both know, has this monster mm-hmm. catalog of videos. Mm-hmm. What do books give you that video systems don't give you? I'll answer that. I think for me, it's everything in one place. You know, a, an author has put oftentimes years of thought into a book and I can take it with me. Right. It's everything in one place and I can take it with me, and I can easily share it. I can hand it to you. I can hand it to someone else. And that's obviously a lot more difficult to achieve with a video or with a blog post. Now, I can sometimes or a podcast even I can sometimes reach a lot more people with a podcast or a blog post or a video. But books are unique in that way. It's everything in one place and a lot of thought and years worth of research oftentimes and, and work have gone into it. And I can so easily share it with, with someone else once I've gotten out of it, what I've sought to get out of it. I was thinking mm-hmm. as you were talking to Jeff about handing it to somebody, the book is 80,000 words and the video might be. 10 minutes and uh, there's a depth of knowledge that you can get from the book. Yeah, there certainly is. Now, sometimes that's overwhelming for some. It's like, well, that's why I want to watch the video because I can, I can consume that in five minutes or whatever versus however long it might take me to read this book. If that's you, if you struggle with that, uh, that's where some of the techniques that Jesse and I talk about in the book can, can come to your aid, whether that's skimming or speed reading. I like skimming personally. Jesse's the speed reading expert, but I love skimming nonfiction in particular. And uh, when it comes to deciding what authors I might interview on my podcast, I had somebody ask me earlier today, I imagine you've been in a situation where you've had to interview somebody uh, for a book you didn't really like all that much. And I said, no, no, that's never happened because I, at the very least, skim the book first and use that technique we talk about in Read to Lead to make sure that the author that I'm about to interview is, is worth everybody's time. I don't want to waste anybody's time. And so if the author's on my show, it's somebody I feel is worth your time. So that would be reading the uh, headings and subheadings of a particular chapter. And by the way, you don't have to start with chapter one in nonfiction necessarily. You can start with where your interests lie. And that would be followed by reading the first and last sentence of each paragraph. And doing that will give you oftentimes the key insights and main ideas from that particular chapter Mm -hmm. and certainly give you enough to talk about the book intelligently as I often have to do. (laughs) I often, (laughs) I often look for key stories as well. I'm I'm just a story. I learn through stories. And so I'll do the same thing, Jeff, but, but look for some of those stories that I can learn from and draw from Jesse, Mm -hmm. a related question, audio book versus the tactile book. A lot of people that listen to this show also like audiobooks. Is there one that's preferable to the other or are they better in different situations? 
Uh, I think, yeah, they're better in different situations, whether you're reading or listening to an audiobook. So like audiobooks are helpful, like you're multitasking, commuting, like obviously you want to listen to an audiobook. You don't want to try to read a physical book while you're in the middle of your morning commute to work. Not helpful for you or the people around you. Reading a physical book, for instance, is better when it comes to perhaps retaining information. So, for instance, there was a study done on students who were given the option to read an assignment or listen to it in a podcast or audio format. At the end of that process, they were then given the quiz. So what they found is the students who read the material versus listened to material performed exceptionally better. So one takeaway from that is, well, hey, if you're preparing for an exam uh, or something significant or, you know, maybe reading a legal legal document, I, you know, I'm not sure. But whenever it is like that, then, yeah, like physical books or ebooks in that case are going to be a clear winner versus an audio format. But, you know, for entertainment or I'm in a book club, like there's nothing wrong with listening to an audio book. You're still going to you know hear it. You're going to get the gist of the story and you're going to still come away with you know quite a few things from it as well. There's so many ideas in the book, Jeff. I love uh, listening to biographies on audio. I, I love consuming biographies that way. And something I've done the last couple of years, the first book was with uh, Brandon Burchard's High Performance Habits, is I've started reading the physical book while having the author or the voiceover person read it to me via the audio book. And I'll speed it up to one and a half or you know <laughs> 1.75 speed. And it's almost like I'm cheating at speed reading. The, the book is being read much faster than I could read on my own. And we can we can process much faster than we can talk. And, and that's one of the problems with reading for many of us. And we talk about this in the book is sub vocalization. We often when we read to ourselves. We read every word aloud in our minds. Yeah. And it just takes a really long time. So I'll put the audio book on, speed it up and then follow along in the physical book as the author's reading it. And, and the consumption of those two mediums at the same time simultaneously really helps me retain the information. Really? Yeah. I have never heard anybody do that before. Yeah. I love it. That's, <laughs> that, that's a great <laughs> hack. Uh, do you guys gift books? Oh yeah. What's, I think what, Jeff does more than I do. What's I'm the just being stingy, I think <laughs> you'll get along with our frugal crowd here on Stacky Benjamins, yeah. Jesse. Oh, love it. Just but, yeah, put me in the crowd then. But Jeff, you guys talk about book recommendations and how mm -hmm. uh, must reads are generally books that everybody else is talking about. I know I read uh, maybe a year ago, a year year and a half ago about a fiction book that Bill Gates like called the Rosie project. And I don't read much fiction either. And I read the Rosie project just because if Bill Gates was reading fiction, it was probably mm -hmm. something I laughed my head off. It was one of the <laughs> funniest books. Everybody should read the Rosie project. It's so good. Mm -hmm. But Jeff, is there a specific book or books that you really like to gift? Yeah, for me, when it comes to young leaders in particular, I'm often gifting a book by Liz Weissman called Multipliers, How the Best Leaders Make Everyone Smarter. It was co-written with Greg McEwen, who would go on later to write Essentialism, The mm -hmm. Disciplined Pursuit of Less, which is other, another book that I highly recommend. Um, and sort of a companion to that book is The One Thing by Gary Keller and Jay Papasan. But then there's the classics, too, that I'll often recommend to my, my teenage nieces and nephews when they come of age. Uh, and that's books like Seven Habits of Highly Effective People and How to Win Friends and Influence People. Now, admittedly, some of those teenage nieces and nephews that are more like I was when I was their age, it doesn't really resonate. Uh, but there are one or two where it, it it's the other extreme. I mean, it's really, truly honest to goodness resonated. So with those that it hasn't resonated with, I've asked them to consider revisiting it the next year or the next year. And I, and I identify with that. I remember someone recommending to me when I was in my early 20s and, and a non-reader I was wanting to pursue radio sales because I was so, well, that's where the real money is in radio. It's in sales, not in programming. And they recommended and gifted me Zig Ziglar's Secrets of Closing the Sale and Augmandito's, I think, Greatest Salesman That Ever Lived or Greatest Salesman in the World. Yeah. And they just, they, I, I, they didn't connect. I just, I think I was too immature at the time to appreciate them for what they were. But 10 years after that, when uh, similar uh, nonfiction type books are being recommended to me, suddenly it's like, you know, when the student is ready, the master appears kind of a thing. And boy, it clicked at that point. So so as you recommend books, know that not every book is going to be a hit, but don't take that personally as I used to do. It may not be a hit now, but it could be a year or two later, but they'll remember you for having having planted that seed, I think. Seven mm. Habits of Highly Effective People that you mentioned was one of those books for me, Jeff, that I did not mm. get it when I read it. And then I realized 10 years later, I quote it all the time. 
I, when, <laughs> when, when, when I read it, I just didn't think it was that important. I and then I it. find myself always saying, sharpen the saw and begin mm-hmm. with the end in mind. Yeah. Nonstop. Mm-hmm. Jesse, is there a book or a couple books that you can tell our listeners that have really influenced your career more than others? You know, I, was, I have a really hard time identifying specific books. Now I can point to the, you know, the art of war I mentioned earlier, because that was just so prevalent at that moment in time in terms of that was the first book. Yeah, it's your first, favorite. Uh, it's your favorite dating book. Yeah. Right. It is. Yeah. Like, I don't know. Yeah. It didn't. I don't know if it helped me date or not better, but yeah, it could be. Maybe <laughs> we can adapt it. But uh, yeah, so that was a great, great. So I can remember that. But a lot of times with the books I read, I kind of think of them more like meals. I eat breakfast, lunch and dinner and they become a part of me. But then when it comes to specific books, I could think of seasons and times. But anyways, so with that, the books I recommend just come out of conversations with talking with people. Maybe it's someone is uh, in one of the chapters in the book. We walk people through a process of like, hey, here are different ways to read books like, you know, you read books for personal change or enrichment or entertainment or professional development uh, or wisdom and questions people can ask themselves to help them understand what to best read. So normally with that, I don't have like one or two go to books that I recommend or purchase for people. It's normally in the midst of a conversation. We're talking about something and like, oh, that reminds me of so and so you should really get this or Uh, One thing I like to do if people are at the house, I've got quite a few books like, oh, I'd really like to read that book. Well, I don't loan books out any longer because I realize very quickly that people tend to forget to bring them back. So (laughs) so instead, it's like I become territorial with the the books. It's like, (laughs) well, how can I not loan it to you? But I'm going to either purchase you a copy or I'm going to go ahead and give this to you. And I'm just going to rebuy this book for myself. (laughs) The book is called Read to Lead, The Simple Habit That Expands Your Influence and Boosts Your Career. You talk about in the book how this seems easy. It isn't easy. You also talk about strategies like Jeff mentioned earlier to read either faster, or retain more. The fantastic read. I know you can get it a lot of different places, but I think you guys have a website set up, right, with additional tools? Yeah, if you're listening to this and it's before August 31st, uh, you can get $500 in additional resources in addition to getting the book for 40% off. That's at readtoleadbook.com. If this happens to be after August 31st when you're hearing this, uh, we still encourage you to go there. There are a number of outlets uh, linked to from there where you can can grab the book. And also, if you want to kick the tires and download the introduction in the first chapter for free, you can do that there as well, readtoleadbook.com. Jeff spoken like somebody who said words like that before for other authors. <laughs> a few times. I, I also have to ask, while well, I have you here about the podcast, my friend, tell us what's coming up on the Read to Lead podcast. Uh, just uh, released an interview with Stephen M. R. Covey, whose dad wrote Seven Habits I, of, of <laughs> Highly Effective People. We were just talking about that. Yeah, I'm going to be a, a guest on my own show soon. And, and Jesse, I hope, is going to uh, join me. So that's going to be interesting. Jody Mayberry, I think, is going to conduct that interview. I think you probably know Jody. So, yeah, lots of cool authors coming up. Some you might know, some you may not. Dr. Sabrina Starling, Dory Clark is one of my favorites. She's coming back for a third or fourth visit now on the show. Jill Young, John Meese, Chris McClure. So it's not always, you know, famous names. Um, I think that would kind of be boring. But it's books that are current books that are new, but books that I have find interesting for one reason or another on a, on a variety of, of nonfiction related business focused topics. So you never know what's coming next, but it's always going to be a great read because... Yeah. I've read it first and deemed it so. <laughs> <laughs> You've given it your blessing. I've given it my blessing. <laughs> 